continuing our topic, our discussion of chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation. I want to talk about eosinophils. So, if we get a parasite, eosinophils are um, a, a cell, a white blood cell, that respond to parasites um, most frequently. And it's through the IgE pathway. And it, we'll discuss what these IgE and IgG and all these other Ig, um, you know, uh, proteins or structures are, molecules are. But these eosinophils. So if you remember an E and an E, uh, you know, you can you can kind of remember these um, eosinophils, and they respond to parasites and to allergies. And um, these they they produce this um, this uh, they they call it a highly basic cation or uh, this this um, this molecule and this protein is, and it's very very toxic to these parasites and it will kill them but these but the the highly basic this highly basic protein is also very toxic to endothelial cells. So if you get a parasite, these eosinophils are going to respond to it. They're going to take out the parasite, hopefully, but they're also going to take some of your endothelial cells out, which is, um, you know, I'd rather sacrifice some of my endothelial cells than having this parasite wreak havoc in my body. So these eosinophils respond and take care of parasites. Now the next cell we're going to talk about are mast cells. Mast cells um, are kind of these like ma macrophages. They're outside the bloodstream. So if this is the blood stream, they're already out here. And they're just kind of waiting around, um, you know, waiting, waiting around to see what happens and, you know, what to do. And when these when they're triggered they release histamine and they, re they so they do histamine and they release um arachidon uh, arachidonic um metabolites so and these are responsible for anaphylactic shock i don't know if we, we've heard of that but it's you know, when you have severe aller an allergenic re response to something, like for example, my wife, she is um, allergic to bees, and if she gets stung by a bee, she can have really bad responses to that because she's allergic to them, and these mast cells just kind of over secrete these 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 stru these um, substances here, which cause which can be um, you know deadly in certain cases. So. These mast cells are very good, but if they get over overly anxious, that's not so good. So these mast cells can are recruited in um, acute inflammation because this histamine causes vasodilation and, va and increased vascular permeability. Same with the arachidonic acids. Um, they can undergo. Um, you can watch the video on that, but they can undergo the cyclooxygenase or the lipooxygenase enzyme pathways to kind of promote and augment the inflammation response. And if these, if the acute inflammation does process doesn't take care of the problem, well then it will just continue on releasing this stuff, and it will kind of convert to a more chronic, chronic inflammation process. So next we're going to talk about the systemic effects of inflammation. So the systemic effects of inflammation can be kind of classified as a, an acute phase response. And if you've ever had flu, influenza, then you've definitely felt the systemic effects of inflammation.
you know, systemic meaning your whole system, your whole body uh, gets affected by this inflammation process. And it's all because of this acute phase response. So what are the kind of um, uh, steps or, or uh, symptoms, signs and symptoms that are associated with this acute phase response? So the first um, thing we're going to talk about with the systemic effects of inflammation is a fever. We've all had a fever. So what kind of happens when we have a fever? So a fever is a response to a pyrogen. And there are endogenous and exogenous pyrogens. And um, let's just say you have a bacteria inside um, so you have a bacteria inside your body somewhere let's there's a byproducts or these little uh, chemicals that bacteria let off um, that are called LPS lipopolysaccharides and these lipopolysaccharides are are um, noted by cells and then the cells, they're detected by cells, and then certain cells, and then the cells um, produce interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor. So this is an example of an exogenous pyrogen, and these are examples of endogenous pyrogens. Pyrogen is just a substance that causes a fever. So what happened is these substances, we have already talked about these two uh, molecules uh, in length now, but they go up to a part of your brain. Let's just say, you know, this is, this is your brain here. There's a part inside your brain that's called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is considered a link between the, your central nervous system and your endocrine system, endocrine system. So what that does is your central nervous system is in charge of you know mostly electrical impulses and things like that, and the endocrine system is more of a hormone, um, blood pathway type of a system. So there's only one endocrine system but this so the hypothalamus is the link kind of between these two systems for these two systems to communicate and what happens is that these two um, substances this interleukin 1 and this tumor necrosis factor they kind of come up here they're circulating in the blood and they cause vascular changes inside this hypothalamus so this hypothalamus will will send off um, uh, chemical chemical signals that will reset your temperature control and these chemical signals reset temp control so they'll reset your temperature control so then you feel your body instead of 98.6 degrees thinks that normal is 101 or 102 and so that's how you feel this fever. Now, why does this do this? Why do we have a fever in response to some kind of bacteria? Well, um, it's been shown in um, certain, um, you know, animals that this fever helps ward off bacteria. If it, the environment's hotter, you know, maybe certain bacteria won't want to live there. Or, you know, a fever also raising the temperature also increases chemical activity. Um, so there might be more chemical reactions happening in your body to fight this bacteria faster. We don't know why exactly um, the fever is so beneficial. We, and the, the pathways um, aren't actually um, completely um, clear on that. But we just know that this is a response to bacteria and it's considered usually a good thing if it doesn't get too high but if you know if you have a child that has a fever I have two kids so they get fever sometimes when they get sick and you have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs NSAIDs
like um, ibuprofen, um, acetaminophen, you know, Advil, these types of these types of children's Tylenol, these types of drugs, the nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And we've already talked about this, but just for a recap, you have this arachidonic acid, and you have an enzyme called COX-1 and 2, and these produce prostaglandins. So these arachidonic acid, this COX-1 and COX-2 enzyme, takes arachidonic acid and converts it into prostaglandins, which then cause also can cause this fever. So what happens is these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they knock out this COX, this COX, the cyclooxygenase enzyme, which is called abbreviated COX-1 and COX-2. So you don't get these prostaglandins, which then further promote and feed into causing this fever. So that's how you bring a fever down with these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, is it's knocking out this, these enzymes that produce these prostaglandins. So the next type of reaction or systemic effects of inflammation can be seen in the elevated plasma levels of acute phase proteins. And the three most common acute phase, acute phase proteins are C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, and serum amyloid A protein, SAA. And the liver usually makes these, these proteins or these uh, acute phase proteins. And so when the, when, you know, if you're, if you're feeling sick, if you're, you're feeling, you're feeling not good, you're going to go into the doctor and the doctor might order some blood work. What are some of the blood work that he's going to order? Just try, try to find out what, what's going on. Is he's going to order maybe a CRP? So he's looking for a C-reactive protein, and the C-reactive protein is created in response to inflammation. Then he might also order an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and this has to do with fibrinogen. And what will happen is that if you have a vial here and you put some blood into it, the blood contains, you know, RBCs, plasma, all the proteins inside of it contains water, contains a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things. So what will happen is these are uh, these red blood cells. If you just put them in there and you just leave them, they're they're going to be more dense, so that they're going to start falling at a normal gravity you know, if you just let gravity pull them down, they're going to settle out over time. So maybe you'll have, you know, all this will be red blood cells. So there is a process called erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So how fast, how fast does this process happen? There's a, there's a standard, you know, uh, you take you know, the average of thousands of people, millions of people and then they know okay so this is the average at which these blood cells will come down well if you have problems if you have inflammation and you have more of these acute phase proteins this fibrinogen it's going to change this erythrocyte sedimentation rate so they're at this ESR so if you know if the doctor orders blood work and says hey you know you got an increased sed rate that means that there's some kind of inflammation process that's going on in your body, which is, you know, obvious because you're having fever, you're having other signs and symptoms, you know. Um, but these acute phase proteins just kind of let you let let you know the clinicians know that there is kind of some inflammation process going on, and so it kind of promotes further investigation. Another thing that a doctor might order is want to know your white blood cell count and a white blood cell count because we've talked about these um, you know these acute inflammations and chronic inflammation and these blood cells that are involved in the process well they might draw your blood and want to know your white blood cell count and you might have uh, leukocytosis which means increase in the number of white blood cells. 
So let me scroll down here. So if you have a white blood cell count and you get back, you know, and the, the blood work comes back and say you have leukocytosis, that means you have an increase in the white blood cell. And then they kind of can break it down from from there even more. So what are the white blood cells? Well, you have neutrophils, um, uh, lymphocytes. You have you have eosinophils. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So what you can have is you can have with each one of these you can have you can have too much or you can have too little with each one of these okay so you can have and then too much is uh, cytosis usually too little is ilia so you can have neutrophilia or neutrocytosis you can have lymphocytosis or lymph I think lymphophilia is a, a different one, but eosinophilia, uh, you know, you can have too much or too little of each one of these in all the white blood cells. And why would you have, you know, let's just think about this. Why would you have an increase of white blood cells in an inflammation response inside your blood? Well, if you have an inflammation response, inflammation, you're going to get um, recruitment, you know, we did a whole video on leukocyte recruitment. You're going to get leukocyte recruitment. So these white blood cells, this is a white blood cell, they're going to diapodes out into the extracellular matrix. Now, there's, you know, the body's going to sense, hey, listen, we don't have any white blood cells in our blood. So what's going to happen is this bone marrow over here inside your inside your bones it's going to eject or put into your blood eject um, white blood cells a whole lot of them and they might be even premature which is called a shift to the left shift to left that's just kind of a shift to the left is sometimes a term that they use in blood work but this they're going to be premature because the body's saying hey we don't have enough of these and we're fighting an infection so I'm going to give these bone these bone uh, marrow is going to inject all these white blood cells these reserves also of white blood cells into your bloodstream so they're going to be dumped into your bloodstream and you're going to show leukocytosis when they take your blood, you're going, whoa, I have way too many leukocytes in my bloodstream. Well, it's because you're fighting an infection, and the body knows that, and so it needs to have all the resources available to help fight this infection. And also, you're going to feel, you can. what are the other systemic effects? You can also feel malaise. You can also feel tired. You just want to sleep. You can, uh, you know, all these signs and symptoms, and we're all familiar with the signs and symptoms of the flu or other um, problems that we feel when we're when we're sick or when we're fighting something and you know these are thought of to be um, cytokines uh, you know hitting certain receptors in the brain so the brain interprets all these cytokines and chemicals that are being released as hey I'm sick uh, and then you know the brain's going to want to shut down and want you to sleep so you can fight off the infection um, you know and so all these types of things uh, we feel and it's because you, they, they believe it's because of the cytokines um, going in and interacting with the brain alright so that has that wraps it up for chronic inflammation and the systemic effects of chronic inflammation we'll see you in the next video